everybody quiet, please. We interview Stephen Burkhoff, actor, playwright, who talks about the old Jewish community in the East End back in the day. Quiet. I first met Stephen on the Craze film, and um, it was a, there was a scene. I don't know if you probably have seen the scene. We were on the stairs, going up and down the stairs. We was in the, um, the club in in, um, in Piccadilly. Uh, what's it called? The pa pa Cafe de Paris, I think, what's it called? Yeah, yeah. yeah, we're in there, yeah. And the lady sings in there. We're on the stairs, going up and down the stairs. Well, we're there for about, it must have been three quarters of an hour. And Gary was being a bit intimidated by Stephen, yeah? In the scene, if you know what I mean, yeah? Because he didn't know how to handle that situation. So Steve's coaching him, yeah? <laughs> Tell him to squeeze your hands, stand like this. It went on for about half, three calls. I said, I thought I've had enough of this. I've got to go somewhere, right? So when he walked in, I went, come here, I'll fucking smash your face. Right? Then he looked over like that. They went, cut. But they never put that in the film, you know. They just put that in the film. And then Stephen said, I want to speak to you. Like, I come to my dressing room. And then we've been friends ever since. My ma was called Polly. Yep. So then when we had a parrot, obviously that had to yeah. be called Polly. Pauline. And she was one of 11 children. They had a lot of kids in them days, eh? Well, I don't think it because it's them days, they didn't have much money for heating. Okay. So when you went to bed at night, you know, they had to cuddle each other to keep warm. Yeah. And as they're cuddling each other, they get a little bit aroused. Yes. And they, they want to warm up a bit because it's freezing and they've got little money for coal. So they grab on and have a little bit of uh, what they call... Um, there's a word for it. Love making. No love making, and Yiddish is something different. Okay. I forget the name. Anyway, so my grandmother and grandfather, they came over from Russia. Yeah, that's it. And Romania. Uh-huh. On my father's side from Romania. Were they? Yeah. Romanians? I so I'm know. Romanian. Okay. Berkowitz. <coughs> On my mother's side, Hyman. They came from uh, Odessa in Russia. Okay. Anyway, she was one of 11 children. There's not a lot of work around. Yeah. And so people did the traditional jobs then. Uh -huh. And, of course, the Jews were incredibly skilled. Yes. This was the peculiar thing, whereas all the Gentiles, and unfortunately, you know, yep. whether they are Jamaicans or the Irish, had no skills. Okay. Now, the skills came because in Russia, Jews were not allowed to work except in two or three industries. Okay. They could be tailors, they could be scrap merchants, they could be beggars yep. gathering up, like you have any old iron, any old iron, any old yeah. iron. So they only had two or three professions that were sanctioned by the state. Yeah. Because the Jews could only do this, could only live in certain areas, could not own property. So they, out of this, yeah. became tailors. Okay. So tailoring became the main industry of the Jewish people. Okay. So they're all tailors. So in the East End of, say, 1902 or three or something like that, there were about 100,000 Jews. 
And out of the 100,000 or so, at least 50,000 were tailors. Really? Yeah, many as that, and maybe 25,000 were furniture makers, because they were allowed, that's another thing I forgot, they were allowed to be furniture makers. So they could repair furniture, and they could make a suit. Uh So they're all tailors. But in tailoring, there are many different forms. They could be a cutter. And my uncle Sam, who was a tremendous, clever, intellectual, working man, uh-huh. communist. He was a trouser cutter for about 60 years. Others would be a buttonhole maker. Yep. So each one would have a different function. Right, yeah. So they had all these tailors. Now the young kids, maybe they went to the youth club, they didn't want to be tailors. You know, they didn't want to fit into the old world of their parents. But you had a few villains, Jewish people, didn't you? Villains, there was a few villain Jews. Oh, God, there were many, many, many villains. But a lot of them, when they went to the clubs, the clubs encouraged them to do physical training to keep fit yeah. and put a boxing Clever. ring, a gym in the Jewish clubs. Suddenly, the Jewish kids loved boxing. Yeah. They loved it. And they became very proficient at it. And so they didn't want to go the way of their mums and dads and sit in a, a, a what they used to call sweatshops, yeah, you know, I cutting know away yeah, and tailoring, yeah, yeah. you know, from early morning to late at night. Yes, and the, the, the tailoring business would fluctuate. There are times when there was no business and it was a slump. And they'd all used to queue up near Petticoat Lane, hundreds of them standing in the street waiting for jobs. You know, who, who's a trouser cutter, number one, or, you, or this, who's a baster, yeah. who's a buttonhole maker, who's this? And so the kids didn't want to do that. So instead, they became boxers. Uh-huh. So my uncle, Alf Mansfield, yeah. here is an old Picture. photograph. Yeah, I can see. Of uncle Alf Mansfield. Can you get that on the camera? He's on the right, Mansfield, and Wald's on the left. Yeah. Now, Uncle Alf Mansell was a lovely guy. Yeah. I loved him, but when I knew him, he was blind. In he was blinded eye. in the ring, not in, one in, eye. In both eyes, yeah? Both eyes. He oh, fought God. with one eye. Oh, that's right, yeah. He fought Jimmy Wilde blind in one eye, but he yeah. didn't tell the authorities because yeah, he would have been not allowed, otherwise he'd suffer too much punishment. Yeah. So, Uncle Alf, fought at Wonderland, which was a great boxing yeah. arena in Oldgate. And then when they closed it down because it was a dangerous place, there's too many uh, health problems yeah. there, hazards and fresh air and fire exits and yeah. a lot of gambling went on there. And uh, even, you know, a bit of villainy and etc. But that was Wonderland. It was the most fantastic place in the East End. We used to go there and his mum and dad watch Alfie fight. He won everything, but then he started to lose a little bit. Yeah. But he was good. So he comes back to Batty Street, where we all, lived. where they lived. Yeah, they lived, okay. You know, where my ma lived, uh, which is just off Commercial Road. Yeah. And he'd come back on those warm summer nights and the crowds and leaning out the window saying, I'm good on one, Alfie! Did you win, Alfie? Yeah, of course I won. I knocked them out in two rounds. Bang, he's lovely. And they said, oh, wonderful. And all the family were there, mum yeah. and uh, brothers and sisters and, uh, and all, 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 the, all the, what they call in Yiddish, Mishpucha, all the family. And my mum, Polly, and the parrot, all were waiting. And she was the youngest of 11. Uh-huh. And Uncle Alf adored her. He's my uncle. So what he did, when she was about five, after he won a few matches, yeah. he gave them all money and he bought my mother a piano, which she adored. And they okay. slapped the piano upstairs. And my mother leapt on the piano and within weeks she was playing. And within months she was playing for the school. Yeah you know, playing at the assembly. This is my mother, she was wonderful. The odd thing about this is I inherited that need to play the piano. Okay. It was in her blood. So when I was five or six, I said, Ma, can I have a piano? Can I learn to play the piano? 
And she said, no, no, we, we won't be here forever in Luton. Um, and then we, we, we can't, maybe later, later. And then next year, can I get the piano? And I asked for a piano for about 10 years. I really? never got it. Now, if a parent hears a child of five or six, they want to play the piano, you think, of course. Yeah, but course. they were a little bit innocent or ignorant. So I put my artistic um, inclinations yeah. into tailoring words. Yeah, I got you. Yeah. Taking after my dad. Yeah. Instead of tailoring suits, I tailored words. words Instead yeah. of making a suit, I made a scene, of I course. made a play. Yeah. So maybe I had to say to myself, I've got that. Yeah. So Uncle Alf, yes. when he fought Jimmy Wilde, I have a picture of him holding him up. He knocked him out. Jimmy Wilde falls forward, and my uncle, who is such a, he's a little bit of a gentleman. Yeah. They all were then. Held him up. He <laughs> didn't yeah. let him fall Should to the floor. It's silly. Yeah. And so Uncle Alf is my real one connection. Yeah, to the boxing. To the boxing. Yeah. And that was in the early, early part of the century. Yeah. Of the, of the yeah. 20th century. Oh, that's going back, yeah. And he fought and fought and fought and fought and fought and fought. And then one day before, and he, uh, he had a bit of damage in his eye. Okay. And the damage didn't go away. Yeah. And then he, he formed a cataract. Okay. Well, you he can't could. cut them out then, could you? Well, you could, could but you not, not very successfully. Okay. And then, but he still fought. Yeah. He fought blind in one eye. Okay. That's so courageous. Yeah. Blind in one eye. And that was a terrible fight he had with. This man. He boxed Wild twice, you told Jimmy me. Jimmy Wild, yeah, twice. So he beat him twice, Wild, yeah? Yeah, he did. Did he knock him out twice or did he beat him on points and knock him out? Um, he knocked him out. Okay. And Wild was, you know, the, the featherweight champion of the world. Flyweight. Flyweight champion, yes. <laughs> I stand corrected. The ghost with the hammer in his hand. What? The ghost with the hammer in his hand. The ghost with the hammer in his hand. With the hammer in his hand? Yes, it. That's right. That's correct. The ghost with the hammer in, in his hand. hand. <laughs> And that's a wonderful description. It is. You know what they used to call me? What they used to call you? The ghost with a salami in his hand. <laughs> what made them boxers? <clears throat> because they went to the gym and they sparred. And they saw their home life and they saw their mums working, many of them still working, and their dads yeah. slapping to the workshop, to the sweatshop, sweatshop yeah. day after day with bundles of cloth. I remember my dad with a sewing machine in the front room and he was always yeah, doing the machine. They didn't want that. They suddenly became enamored of the English life. Oh, I see. Because there was nothing like it where they came from. Oh, I got in you. Russia, they were living and forced to live in yeah. areas we call ghettos. Ghettos, yeah. And the ghetto, the famous Venice ghetto, which Shakespeare bases his play, okay. The Merchant of Venice, a okay. Jewish ghetto. They lived in ghettos. The kids could play a little bit and maybe fight a little bit. Yeah. But it was organized. Suddenly in London, you had Jewish youth clubs. You had health clubs. You had areas where people were free. They could walk anywhere. They could go up the West End and go to the cinema and go to the cameo. So they loved, it. they loved England. They loved it because it was free. So what made them boxers was they didn't want to be in those stinky yeah, workshops. They didn't want to be like their bums and No, bums, they so. thought maybe they could become they professional. Free, yeah. They saw what was going on and they became. So suddenly, for the first time in history, yep. The Jews, who are always a minority, superseded the Gentile fighters who dominated the whole of Great Britain. There were great Welsh boxers, and oh, yeah. Irish boxers, boxers and Scottish right. boxers. Yeah. The Jews beat them all. Did they? They had matches. Sometimes there's a Jewish boxing league, and the Jews beat every single one of them. Every weight? Not in every weight, <laughs> in mostly in the light weight because the working class then yeah. all loved each other, cared for each other, well, yeah. helped each other. Yeah, when the docks were on strike in the 40s, which yeah. even I remember, yeah. being an elderly fellow, yeah. they were on strike and they had nothing, they had no wages, no food, nothing, just scraps. The Jews came down 
and help them. Now, you have here the highway. Yeah. Well, the Gentiles and Irish lived south of the highway in, in Wapen. In Wapen, yeah. The Jews lived north of the highway in commercial roads. Yes. So all the synagogues and everything were north of the highway. That's right. The Jews used to cross over, but they didn't want to always because it was, um, they thought it was a tough area of Irish. Yeah. But they went and helped them. And what the Jews did is some of them would try to go off and get work somewhere, just doing scrap work or working even for the Jews, doing, yeah. you know, collecting and delivering. So what the Jews, they took their babies and looked after them for the day when they were working. They brought milk for them. They bought bread, sugar, <coughs> excuse me, and sometimes cheese, sometimes a little piece yeah. of beef, no pork, of course. This is the Irish people looking after. The, the Jews looking after the Irish. Well, my family come from, my mother's family, Culligan. Yeah, they were Irish. Irish. They in the dock. That is right. Yeah, and he, he, he goes back to his father. They come over here. And, exactly. Uh, and, and he was, uh, they were, um, as I say, a long time ago. They formed a connection. They're both working people. Yeah. Tailoring, there were too many tailors, you see, because they had fled from the Tsar of Russia. Yeah. yeah. Fled from that, what they called pogroms, where they were persecuted because those the stinking Tsars and all those Russian dreck. Yeah. The inheritance of that, of course, is Putin, who, is, who lives and works and acts like a gangster, like a Tsar. So they formed connection with the Irish. Yes. Now, one day, of course, the tailoring business was awful, and they had to strike because they were paid so little, because there were so many of them that were going to the tailors. Uh -huh. They went on strike, thousands of them. Okay. And who do you think helped them? I don't know, you tell me. I'll tell you, who do you think? The Irish? If, exactly. The Irish they so returned the favour. They did? The Irish, the poor working class what did they do? Irish dockers they gave you food, who didn't even yeah. have proper clothing, or yeah. even underpants, and when they worked on the docks, you could see their balls hanging out. Really? Yeah, you used to yeah, go, oh, look, yeah, I swear. You swear? Yeah, that's true. You see the ball hanging up. Yeah, that's it. And I tell you, this is true. I was just a child, I remember that. And they not only helped the Jews, they came and returned the favour. That's nice, then. It was fantastic. They came, and not only did they return the favour, the Jewish community was such that they could look after their children if others were doing part-time work. But they gave them money. They did? Yeah. To that's survive. That's unbelievable. I the never Irish. That, I never heard that story. Money. I think they came down yeah. one day with a hundred pounds. Wow. Irish. Irish Gentiles giving Jews money. They were the real Irish people. They yeah. Were. They said, you know, you do if you need a few pallets. No, they were Because they know that you didn't have money. You know, to get your fucking, you know, to get your bagels and your chopped liver yes. and all that. So here they do a hell. No, no, he can't help. No, no, go ahead, really. That's yeah. what, it's a lovely, lovely, because you help out. And when you help, you know, the Irish people, a bit. Something like that. Because in Wapping, you had Protestants and Irish. Yeah, but they were the same. All supported each other, working class people. That was fantastic. There was a connection. Yeah. This connection killed fascism in England. Oh, would do, yeah, of course. No, not of course. In 1936, yeah. I have to sometimes use foreign words here, Fair that for Stinken and Mumza, Oswald Mosley, Mosley yeah. marched with his gutter snipe black shirts, these anti sea mics, yeah. the smell of which is just beginning to percolate in England now, the Labour Party. But then, the Labour Party was staunch anti Semitic uh, against them. So, Mosley came in 36 with thousands and thousands of black shirts. And the police supported him for the right to march. Yes. The Jews, of course, in Cable Street, put up all the furniture and things. You will not pass. But the Dockers was there too. Yes. To help you. Right. They was, yeah. The Irish Dockers. Why? Because the Jews had supported them in their time of need. The Irish coming 
And that was fantastic, coming to help. So after that was over, well, just before that, before yeah. the war killed everything, yeah. stopped everything. But amazing how many Jews come out into the boxing world. Yeah, that's and true. And became not just well, good fighters, world Champion. champions. Well, Ted Kid Lewis. You know Kid Lewis? Of course, and Ted Kid Lewis. Yeah. Now, they went to America, which is the home of champions and tough guys, and, the and they beat. whipped them all. No, no, they, did. they couldn't believe it. They went fought wherever they fought, Madison Square Garden. Yeah. They fought the champion flyweights and all those people, featherweights, bantamweights, maybe not bantamweights. And they beat them, because the Americans could not believe this. They hey, guys. You see these, these, these kikes from England? How That's can they beat you? They whip your ass, man. Yeah. yeah, okay, well, a little bit now, nah, man. So they came back. So Ted Kidd Lewis. Ted Kidd, yeah. Went there and he fought. Unlike today, you fight five fights and then you're a contender. Yeah, of course, yeah. We know. There they had 105 fights before they got to that position because there were thousands well, of boxers, each trade. one good. Yeah, you only trade that way. Precisely. So Ted Kid Lewis came back, and he was, of course, a f most fantastic champion. He was a champion for many, many years. Yes. But he was a bit simple-minded. You told me about that, yeah. Yeah. And then one day a man came to him and says, uh, hey, Ted, yes? You know, I work for this guy, a Mosley. He's a political man, lovely man. You'll like him. And he does marches, but he, he'd like a mind draw or two. We got one at Suba. We like a good one, and you're you're good. You've got big reputation. So, would you kind of uh, would you like to be a minder for uh, Oswald yeah. Mosley? Oh yeah. So he said, yeah, yeah, oh, I love a god. That sure. How are you paying? Yeah, pay five pounds every time you step out. Oh, okay, something. He didn't know he was let. You see, he right? didn't understand. Did he didn't understand. Didn't understand. Too many punches. Yeah, I don't know. He didn't understand. But when he was told, he knocked Mosley out. Did he? Yeah. He actually knocked him out? Knocked him out. Left or right? I'm not quite sure. Uppercut. Might have been an uppercut, might have been a right swing. <laughs> but he said, I hear you don't like Jews or something. I never knew that. I know you spoke against them, but yeah, I thought it was all very political because yeah. of the immigration and all that. And stuff. So he went, pop! Banged him one. Yeah. And that was his great. Another Jew came out of that. Many Jews were Jewish fighters. Ted Kid Burke. Ted Kid Burke. Now, the you thing about the Jewish fighters yeah. is that they weren't just Jewish fighters. They were the best in Great Britain and in Europe. They fought in France. They fought in America. They fought everywhere. So this was a kind of phenomena. How did this happen? They were great poor Irishmen, great fighters from Belfast, great fighters from Cardiff. Yeah. What was it that made the Jew the champions of the world? Starvation, I suppose. Stop poverty. It was yeah, poverty. the contrast between their lives in Eastern Europe, uh -huh. in Romania and yeah. Hungary and Russia and all those other uh, contemptible states which were ruled by tyrants. Yes. And they had restricted the Jew so that when he came here, suddenly he expanded to his full potential. Whereas the Irish, the Scottish, the, the Cardiff people, the Welsh, they had hard lives, but they were never restricted. Yeah. And I think when you're restricted, when you're confined, when you cabined, can. crypt, as Shakespeare would say, yeah. something comes out of you. You're free, yeah. and you have this passion to become a real Jew, not a kind of poor, wall-hugging, threatened Jew, you know, who's, who's going to uh, hit me? Oh, hey, hey, what's happening? Like yeah, that. they're born. Oh, look, here come the Cossacks with their swords. Oh, he makes me a block. No, you're free. Yeah, it is tough. It's so tough. they became good. You mentioned Kid Boyd, right? Kid Boyd, yeah. Fantastic fighter. It's a few years on, because I was talking yeah. pre-war. Yeah. And he was... A now, Kid Burke, I knew him. He was yeah. a kind of friend. Okay. He was the funniest guy. Now, I knew him because when I was a kid, I wanted to become an actor. Okay. So I became an extra. I became an extra. You get paid £3.10, £3.50 in Australia. And there were a lot of characters. Yeah, of ex-boxers, ex-wrestlers, ex-army people, all sorts of yeah. people. 
no extras. And I said, Kid Berg, I said, Kid, hello, I know your son, so your, your nephew. But, oh, yeah, lovely to meet you. And he loved talking, and everybody yeah. loved it. Yeah. We used to play whilst we were waiting for our scene. We all played cards, and if you didn't play right, he'd get mad. Yeah. And people, he said, I'll have you, he said. He, he was very funny. A lovely fellow. And when he used to go into the ring in America, yes, he'd play up the Jewish thing, see? Yeah. Nowadays, they're a bit shy, and everybody's a bit shy to even claim to be Jewish. You'll pretend, well, you know, we're very Gentile. Yeah. Well, we may be Jews, but we're, we're very awfully, you know, we don't throw our chicken soup around the house. We're all very posh. We even play cricket, like lovely Harold Pinter. Jewish playwright plays cricket. Did Lovely. I didn't did know he played cricket. Pardon? I didn't know Jewish would play cricket. People Jews do not play cricket, but some do. I know, when he was a bowler. So when Kid Berg went into the ring in, uh, in New York, he used to come on with a talus. It's a prayer, Jewish prayer shawl Perfect. and a skull cap. <laughs> Send it up. No, he, he took it seriously. He'd come in <laughs> with a prayer shawl and a skull cap and he'd kneel in the corner, as a lot of fighters do in the ritual, they're praying. And he'd kneel in the corner and do a little prayer, like, Oh, okay, zing, zing, pop, pop, there you go. That's, he did that. That's crazy. Then, Kidberg. You know, he lost all his money, the poor man. He used to have a lovely house. He used to live in, didn't he live in Cable Street? He was brought up there. Oh, he was brought up there? Yes, I think so. He was brought up in East, East London, as everybody was. Um, as I believe, so it was Ted Kirk Lewis. But Lewis um, was poor. He, he became poor, didn't he? He was there. Oh, yeah, very poor. I used to see him as I was older, in okay. my 20s, yeah. in the West End. There was a lovely little cafe in Gerard Street where a few actors used to go, one or two boxers. And I said, you're Ted Kid Lewis, congratulations. I admire you, your history is remarkable. Oh, th thank you, son. Have you got, could, could you uh, spare a couple of bob for a cup of tea? Could you spare? I said, of course, of course. And he was reduced to, to doing that. Oh, that's terrible. So spare a couple of bob. You sit there with a spot oh, it tea, it breaks you? your heart. You you this it. man had yeah. been in the ring a hundred and fifty times, oh, no, fighting for his life. Yeah. He's for a couple of them. Heartbreaking. And there are a few others. But then, after war, the Jews uh, still doing tailoring, but they started to venture a little bit outside, uh -huh. largely through the mums. The mother said. Listen, I want you to become a doctor or an accountant, maybe, you know. And the, the kids became accountants and they were not restricted by education restrictions as they were under that scum sucking Tsar of Russia or his, uh, you know, inheritor, Putin and all those other, or Stalin, all those other dogs. They went to grammar school. I, I had the great privilege. Right. It was a privilege. I went to a grammar school in the East End called Lorraine's Foundation. Oh. But they were too fond of uh, the cane. Then eventually, when we moved, because we were still uh, living in a one room. We were hosting. One rush, you had a big flat. No, no. You had a flat with all your family. No, they, they, they said, oh, the two the gold. But the flinch went, went off. No, no, no. Now, we lived in one room in a little tiny kitchenette. Yeah. In Anthony Street. I live in Gravel yeah. Lane. It was one front room, one bed, and then a scullery, they called it. Outside, yeah. outside toilet. Yeah, we had an outside, of course. Quite nice it was a bit cold, didn't it, in the winter? Well, you never felt the cold then, did you? You didn't feel it so much. Right now, you got rid that, of the, the seat. Yeah. What was the seat made of? Wood. 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 Yeah, and you never felt the cold. You never felt the cold. Not no. like cold plastic. No, it's wood. They didn't have plastic no, then. You had a wood, you remember that? Yeah, course, wooden wood, toilet seat yeah. and chickens yeah. in the yard. Yeah, of course. But they, yeah, they've changed. And the demand, the need to prove yourself, to uh, emancipate yourself from the past is not yeah. there anymore. No. Now you want to be a boxer because it's a profession. Then they only did it to escape. Yes. Well, I got into acting in the same way 
that the Jewish boys got into fighting to escape, escape from, from the, from the inheritance. And my family were in like the schmutter business, so to speak. But my father, because possibly because the trade was too volatile up and down, he never bloody taught me anything, never taught me to make a suit. No? Did you ask? Yeah, I thought, thought it would be, I thought, I thought he might say, come in, one yeah. day I'll show you. Well, I would love that. Didn't want me to do it. Didn't want me to do it. I don't know why. So I, got, I couldn't get my piano, couldn't learn tailoring. I had what they say in Yiddish is Gornished. Gornished. That's what you said it perfectly, you're not Yiddish, are you? I'm half Yiddish. Yeah, I thought you were. You I like chicken said, soup. You said Gornished there, perfect. I had Gornished, as the Germans say, Garnished. But the Jews said Gornished. Gornished. So my mind's festering. And what can I do? I leave school. I have nothing. I can't do a, make a chalk marked on a piece yeah, of chalk. Yeah, but you had an education. You could have done something else. Yeah, I had no you education. To save the city. Crappy education. I had bad education. Really? Yeah, they weren't good teachers then. Some people did. I mean, it missed me, so I just drifted for years. But did you sell, you, was a, you sold antiques, didn't you? a salesman. You used to sell antiques. Not antiques. No, I thought you did. Not, not even as good as that. I was working in a men's wear shop. Oh, remember you, yeah, I remember you yes. telling me that, yeah. You know. Uh, nice suit for you, sir. Nice, uh, <laughs> nice shirt to go with it. Yeah. How you fix for ties? Okay, there's a lovely tie. You used to work at these dreadful men's wear shops. Dreadful, dreadful. Where was that? The West End? Everywhere. Really? From the so age they, of 15 they, they to 20. They kept sacking you. 20 years. They kept sacking you. Well, I sacked myself. One or two places were really beautiful. A high class place. I, I worked for a lovely shirt maker in Regent Street called Harry Fisher. Who himself used to be a boxer. Really? Yeah. Very efficient. A little flat nose and charming man. Became a shirt maker. Uh -huh. Very famous shirt maker. I loved this man. I really did like a father. Yeah. But he had an assistant, some scumbag, and he knew we weren't getting yeah. on. So then, how I got into acting was because I needed to get out yeah, of this. I could no longer, standing. without going Shakespearean here, yeah, I, know, I could no longer stand in that effing shop okay. from nine till yeah. six. Yeah. It was driving me insane. So, somebody said, listen, you want to be an actor, don't you? I said, yeah. But you were doing extra work at the time. I was doing extra work. So then they, I said, they said, do you want to be an actor? And you said, yeah. Well, they, that, that was no help except I learned to watch people. Yeah. And then one of the guys there who was also an actor and he was doing it just because he, he'd had no work or there was little work around. He said, why don't you go to evening classes? I went to this fantastic place called the City Literary Institute in Hoban. So I went there one day and I said, can I enroll for a course? And they said, of course you can. By the term, it's five pounds a term. I thought, well, it's not too bad. I paid my five pounds. Yeah. They said, we start in September. It's three, three nights a week. I went in and um, prepared myself, you know, to have the right attitude. And there was the classroom. One or two people were drifting in. Starts at six. And I went in and all the boys and girls, young men and women, were sitting in chairs on both sides. I went in and I shut the door and I felt, um, felt something. No one's going to ask me for a pair of socks. <laughs> it was... Well, a couple of tires. Yes. People said, well, let's practice movement. <gasps> I thought, this is wonderful. I want you to move slowly across the rooms. Be aware of your body. So, I thought, oh, oh, this is, ooh, no, it's cry. wonderful. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> but it was no less yeah, than the young boys who went to the Oxford and St George's Club in Berners the Street. Same thing. Did it's the same thing. It's physical. Yeah. They had to do that. That's, a move That's why I'm same. such a fearful yeah. of boxing because I went the other way. Yeah. I used language. Yeah. yeah. So when you started off, they give you just movement to do before they movement give you Movement before you open your, your mouth. Bomb movement. Yeah, bombarded you, OK. And you get used to them speeches, and then I became yeah. an actor. Well, you were more than that. And then I became a writer. I had to become a writer. And so 
the instinct for acting is not too dissimilar for the young boys and the boxing ring, yeah. to escape. Yeah. And what better world to escape to than to become a prize fighter? Yeah. To have the crowd around you, cool. cheering, you cheering you, to yeah. show your courage yeah. that you could take pain, a yes. terrible punch in the nose which breaks it, yeah. and continue to fight. And your girlfriend may be sitting out there, or your mother, feeling so proud when you come with yes. your little purse. Yeah. What a great thing to be. That's why people are fascinated by boxers and fascinated by actors. Of course. It is the choice for the fantasists. Boxing, dancing, yeah. acting, it's his choice. For us who can do nothing, who have no skills, who have no other skills, who have no particular techniques. You know, we're not physicists. No. We're not brain scientists. We're not a urologist. We're useless. <laughs> but when it comes to courage to step up on that stage, we are the masters. Yeah. <laughs> That's it? That's it. Yeah, that's it.